This conference will now be recorded. All right. So welcome, everyone, <laughs> to our, our topic today, uh, the 2020 Summer Reading Program. My name is Courtney Wimmers, and I'm the Outreach and Engagement Specialist at the Mid-Hudson Library System. Um, so this is something that I've seen people starting to talk about and be very confused by is the 2020 Summer Reading Program. And I just want to start off this webinar with a disclaimer that I do not have um, answers on what this will look like, uh, but I just want to kind of point you in the right kind of direction and start thinking about things and hopefully spark some ideas um, to get you think about thinking about how the Summer Reading Program will look this year because it's going to look very different. Uh, that's the one thing that I think that we can all agree on. Um, so the first thing I would say is first just to prepare for a very different program. Uh, even if social distancing is lifted, people are going to be worried about being in large groups. I know now when I see I'm like watching TV shows and I see large groups of people, I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> they're not allowed to do that. So even once this this pause is done and social distancing becomes a little less restricted, um, people are still going to be nervous about being in large groups for a while. Um, like I said, nobody is sure what this year is going to look like yet. We just know that it's going to be nothing like we've ever done before. And I just want to uh, also have you keep in mind that every community is different and something that may work for one community may not work for yours. So if if you see an idea in here today or you hear somebody say something, um, it might work really well for their library. It might not work well for yours, but you could kind of take some ideas and adapt them and hopefully come up with a program that best suits the needs of your community. Um, so, but that's my disclaimer is that I don't know what this is going to look like yet, but I want to start thinking about it together. So hopefully we can come up with something really awesome. Um, like Kirsten and I kind of mentioned, we don't have, <laughs> I don't have access to seeing the chat right now, um, but I do want to encourage you to ask questions because uh, there's going to be some different ideas thrown around that we may not have thought of before. Um, so if you have questions, please put them in there and I want to answer as many as we can. Um, so the typical summer reading of the past, or before the plague, <laughs> was we would have a kickoff party usually in early summer, right? Kids would read and get prizes, and then there'd be like an end of summer party. This seems to be like the typical summer reading program that most libraries do. Yours might look a little bit different, but it's it's the generic um, way the program goes. So in 2019, we had 84% of libraries uh, reported on children summer reading program attendance. 62% 62 62 reported on teen summer reading attendance and 46 reported on adult summer reading program attendance. So I thought those numbers were kind of interesting um, because it shows that most of our libraries tend to do a children's summer reading program. Um, a little bit more than half do a teen summer reading program and less than half do an adult summer reading program. So this is something that um, I was just kind of looking at the data from the last summer reading report and I thought it was interesting because I feel like this year, if we want to get um, a lot of people involved in the summer reading program, it has to be more family based. And we should really try to draw in all ages, including adults and more teens. I know teens are always kind of tricky, um, but that just might be something to start thinking about for this coming year is how you can make it more more family based or and across broader age ranges. Um, because I think. It's not just the kids that are going to be looking for some stuff to do this summer. I think a lot of stuff is going to be canceled uh, for everybody, including adults. And if they have a summer reading program, that might be kind of nice. So for the summer reading program of the future, um, we're going to talk today a little bit about virtual re reading logs, where people can track their reading logs online instead of going to the library, um, getting the reading log stamp signed, whatever they do, and uh, getting it back, I think, we're going to try and limit touching stuff as much as possible for a while. So virtual reading logs could definitely be um, a way to eliminate that. Um, I think some things that I've been seeing uh, that have been thrown around online is that people are talking about breaking the program into smaller pieces with like weekly challenges or weekly themed activities instead of um, a whole broad six week program. I know the theme this year is Imagine Your Story and the theme is kind of like fairy tales. Um, so there's definitely a lot to do with that, but that might be something to start thinking about now is maybe breaking your activities or your themes or challenges into smaller pieces. That way um, it's uh, easier for people to digest. 
you might want to also think about a sooner start date, especially since school um, is not in session right now. Tec well, I guess technically it is online, but kids are not physically going to school. I've seen some libraries, I think there was a library in Tennessee that has already started their summer reading program. Um, and I'd be very surprised if schools opened up before the end of the year, just because it doesn't make any sense to me why they would open up for like three or four weeks with all the social distancing measures that would need to be enacted. So I'm anticipating that schools won't be open for the rest of the year and it can't hurt, hurt to start your summer reading program now. Um, but uh, the governor said we'll have an answer to the school's question by the end of this week, which will be kind of be nice. So um, we can kind of gauge that a little better, hopefully by Friday. And the thing that's kind of really hard to swallow is that you should start thinking very seriously about potentially having no or very limited in-person programs. Um, we're really unsure what everything's going to look like, obviously, once the pause gets lifted. We're not sure how many get, uh, people will be, other, be able to gather at one time yet. Um, but I think it's it's fair to say, one, between people being wary about it and two, um, potential restrictions from the governor, that uh, we should really plan to have a lot of our stuff online um, this year. And I know that's really hard uh, to kind of start thinking about is the fact that you can't do like the in-person programs and um, it, it stinks. A lot of this stinks. Um, but we can't, that doesn't, just because we can't do it uh, in the library doesn't mean that we can't do it online and still be just as awesome. So I think it's important to kind of refresh ourselves. What are the goals of the summer reading program? Uh, so one is obviously to teach children literacy skills. The summer reading program has um, long been toted as a way to, to teach children to read, to love to read, to love the library, and to prevent the summer slide. Um, so the summer slide is the idea that when kids don't go to school, they actually uh, slide back in terms of their education a little bit. And libraries have always been the ones to say like, oh, our summer reading program, it prevents the summer slide. We're teaching children literacy and we're teaching them to love libraries and reading. Um, so I think it's really important just to uh, keep these goals in mind as we go through the rest of the stuff we're going to talk about is that these are the things that you really want to focus on. You want to focus on literacy, reading. Um, literacy can mean uh, not just like regular book reading, but also digital literacy, which is very important. Um, I think a lot of us had a major learning experience when all of this first happened and everything kind of shut down in terms of digital literacy and how people may not be as skilled as it, at it as um, they should be in this day and age. I know uh, my grandmother decided to get Wi-Fi and a computer when all this happened. She has never touched anything technology related. So um, I think people are going to be looking for uh, that and too. Um, but I, these are really the goals of the summer reading program is to teach kids literacy, to teach them to love to read and love the library, and to hopefully prevent the summer slide a little bit. So we need to find a balance between programs that focus on liter literacy and education and programs that focus on entertainment. And I think this is really important to keep in mind as you maybe start looking at virtual programmers and virtual programming is that you want to keep people entertained in, and interested in what you're doing, but you also want to focus on the literacy and education aspect of it. Um, <clears throat> So our job is solely not to entertain our communities, it's to hopefully teach them something too and do a little bit of educating. Um, so I think that's that's something that you should really keep in mind when you start thinking about maybe booking performers and especially virtual performers, um, is to, to keep that balance between education and entertainment. So I went to a very interesting session at NYLA uh, last year that was done by the Albany Public Library. And they worked with schools to measure test scores at the end of the school year before the summer reading program started. And then again, at the beginning of the school year after the summer reading program was over. So they actually used like standardized tests and they measured the same kids um, to see what the true effectiveness of the summer reading program was. And um, they found that the summer reading program basically only really helped kids that would have read over the summer anyway, and not by that much. Um, so the whole thing that we say, and that we like to brag about with preventing the summer slide is true, but it only really applies to kids that probably would have 
come to the library and read books anyway, and it didn't really help them by that much. So um, I'd like to think about how maybe we can change this a little bit and actually lean more towards preventing the summer slide a little bit more um, and reaching out to kids that maybe wouldn't have read over the summer or maybe can't come into the library. Um, but I thought this was a very interesting study that they did. Uh, they had a ton of data and everything. I, I don't have it, unfortunately, to share. Um, I couldn't get access to it before this webinar, but um, I'm still going to work on getting that information and putting it on our, on our website at some point because it was it was very interesting. It was a very good program. And it kind of proved that um, libraries have been saying all this great stuff about the summer reading program for so long, but we didn't actually have any data to back it up. So now we kind of do have that data and it shows that yes, we're doing effective things, uh, but we could be doing better. So things that I think that we should include, make sure that we include in this year's summer reading program is that we have to have goals for ourselves as library staff and the participants. So an example for goals for children would be, be to read 10 books this summer or read for like 300 minutes this summer or something something um, like that. And then the goals for the librarians um, should be more along the lines of outcomes in terms of like 90% of summer reading participants will report that they feel more confident when reading after doing the summer reading program. So project outcome is a really cool tool that you can use to capture this kind of information. Um, I don't know if you've heard me talk about project outcome before. If you have, I'm sorry, but I'm going to talk about it again. But it's uh, Project Outcome is a very cool evaluation uh, software that it's free for libraries, and you can use it to measure things like that. Like, do people more feel more confident after coming to your programs? Do they feel like it benefited them? Are they more aware of library resources and things like that? Um, so I'll send out a little bit more information about Project Outcome after this webinar. But I think. Uh, it can be really helpful in helping us set goals for ourselves and helping us actually measure whether we've reached those goals. I think it's really important to also have a clear beginning and an end to the program. Um, sometimes a summer reading program starts with like a big kickoff party and then it just kind of like trickles off and you don't get a sense of completion at the end of it. Um, so I think it's, it's important to have a, a clear beginning and end, set goals, kids know exactly what they're doing, they know how long it lasts, less and um, that can make it really appealing and a little bit less confusing and then uh, also we need to make the program appealing for everybody not just the enthusiastic readers um, so when i was a kid i would go to the library every summer regardless of the summer reading program like i just went there for books and loved to read and i'm sure many of you were like that too um, but it's, it's important to think about maybe the kids that don't like to read as much. Like my youngest brother um, does not read like anything and it's very frustrating. <laughs> so um, how do we make the, the summer reading program more appealing to, to kids who don't, don't quite uh, enjoy reading as much? Um, and I don't have a specific answer for that, unfortunately. <laughs> if you have an answer, put it in the chat because I'd love to hear it. Um, but it's just something to start thinking about. So uh, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about virtual reading logs. I've seen a couple of things that people are using. Um, Google Forms is very nice because it's free. It's easy to access. It's very easy to use. All you need is a Google account. Read Squared is another one that I know a lot of our libraries have signed up for, so you may be familiar with that one. Um, I was poking around online yesterday and did some research and found that uh, Scholastic has a summer of Readapalooza that looked very interesting, um, but you can't really access it till May 4th. But I linked to it. All of these are links, so if you click on it when I send out the slides later, you should be able to access it and check it out. It looks very cool, and kids can track their reading. And um, I think they had something where kids could set goals, and if they reach those goals, Scholastic will donate books to people, which seemed very nice. And then Beanstack is another one that I've seen people using. Um, I'm pretty sure this one is not free and you have to pay for it, but I have seen, um, I think a lot of larger libraries tend to lean towards Beanstack. So in case you haven't used Google Forms before, I wanted to show you a little bit what it looked like. So the picture on the left is just a 
example of a summer reading log page that I made. It's super simple. I just put name, age, and book title. You can make it as crazy as you want, um, but I figured for this, we just needed a simple example. Um, if you've ever used SurveyMonkey, it's kind of like that, but easier, where you can kind of change um, the format and how people respond. You can have multiple choice. You can have short answer. You can have long answer. Um, you can change the theme, so you can change the colors to your library colors. Uh, so it's it's very nice. It's easy to use, and on the back end, it lets you look at all the the data very nicely. Um, so you can export the information that you collect in your Google form into an Excel file. And this is the picture on the right, the example that I have. You can have a timestamp, um, so you can see when people fill it out. You can see people's names, ages, the books that they read, and you can obviously, like in Excel, sort this data any way you want. So um, Google Forms also on their back end has kind of like a really neat thing in how they display the data and they have like pie charts and everything. So um, it's super easy to use. I highly recommend it. It's super easy to, for patrons to use because uh, all they have to do is click on a link and fill out a form. Um, so this would probably be the simplest and easiest virtual reading log that you could use. Um, and so now I want to invite Anna from the LaGrange Library to talk about Read Squared a little bit because they used it at their library last year for summer reading. And I figured it would be better to have somebody who's actually had experience with it talk about it rather than just me. Um, so Anna, hopefully you're unmuted. I am now. Okay, take it away. All right, so Read Squared, um, Essentially, you sign up for it and they create a website for you, which is excellent. Um, and then they give you a, a login. So you pick one administrator. So it's one person. So Mary Wickham and I, the youth programmer, and I shared an account. And that website had multiple programs. I think we had five different programs, one for adult and four for different age ranges of kids. Um, and you can do different programs for for each age range. Like they have one specifically for adults, they have one specifically for like kindergartners. Um, and it was super easy to use. The dashboard that you go to as the administrator has a lot of data on it. It has graphs of who signed up recently, how many points were entered recently, um, who completed something recently. So as you as you enter um, as you enter books or enter minutes, you can choose. Um, you gain badges, and then at the end of it, you get a little like, "Congrats, you finished summer reading certificate that you design." And it, you know, the the theme is already plugged in, so you're already working within the theme. Um, and then at the end, the graphs can be exported to Excel and PDF. I only did Excel. I'm not sure what the PDF PDFs look like, but like Google Forms, you have all of that data that you can then um, export onto your computer. I think the programs were great for kids. I think the adult one was a little saccharin, but um, we'll have to see what the programs look like this year. I did not have as good of a reaction as um, some of the kids did. I don't know if Mary's Mary Wickham's here right now, uh, but I think that if we're going to do it this year again, but I think I'm going to supplement the reading log with something else um, just for the adults. But another another another. Um, really great benefit is that the support for the site is stellar. Like, I had a ton of questions at the beginning because I was like, I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. And I emailed someone and they got back to me within 24 hours and it was great. Like I, for, for example, in preparation for talking to, talking to everyone, I was like, oh, I should actually go back there and like, see, you know, remember what it looks like. And then I'm like, oh, I signed up with my old email because I changed my name recently. And so I emailed them and I'm like, hey, can you uh, 
tell me what tell me what's what's going on they're like oh yeah no we're gonna we'll change your account for your new email here's a new password everything is still there it's great um so for me it was really easy to implement and then once it's implemented you just sit back and let people use it you make an account you sign up for a specific program you enter the books and that's it there i think one of the downsides is that there's absolutely no um interaction between like the librarians and the patron where whereas if you had like a paper log you'd be coming in to get like stamps or to turn it in or to do bingo so i think that's a downside that we're gonna have to work with but all in all, I think it, it was a really great resource for, for us to use. Thanks, Anna. Um, I have to second. Can I? Oh, sh sure. I, Who is it's it? It's Joanne from Beekman. <laughs> okay. um, I wanted to just add something because we've used Read Square, I think, for three years. This will be uh, it's since the beginning of them offering it to us. Um, and um, I think that one of the very, very, um, the, one of the benefits is that if a parent creates uh, the account, they can put all of their children in that account and they can log in with their username and password. And what we always do in Beekman is we tell everybody your username should be your first name, your password should be your last name. It's, it's not your bank account. It's a reading log. Um, they go in and they can see all of their children and they can click on which ones because a lot of them have the same amount of time. We do time, we don't do books. And um, they can just put in, you know, you know, 10 hours this week for three children and, and they're done and they're done. So there's not a lot of, um, you know, there's not a lot of, I don't want to say paperwork because it's not paperwork because it's all on online, but there's not a lot of, um, I feel it's not a lot of work for the parents because they can have a family account and they can see their entire family with one login. So that I think is a benefit. So that's yeah. my two cents. And actually this year they, um, they changed it. So if you want to have an account, just for your kids, you don't have to sign up for a program. Um, Cause in the past we, we kind of made like a dummy program for people like that, but you, this year they changed it so that if you're just a parent who wants to take care of your kids, cause you don't, you don't want your kids on the computer all the time, you can basically be the administrator of that account. Right, what I felt though was because the parent, in the past the parent had to sign up for an account, for, we had more parents, signing up for the adult program and logging their minutes than we had in the past. Yeah, we had the so, exact opposite happen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we had we yeah. had a lot of parents who just signed up and then did nothing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess <laughs> it goes worked both back ways. To, I think yeah. that goes back to what <laughs> what we said at the beginning is that every community is different. <laughs> So something that works really well for one library might not work well for another library, but I thank you for bringing up that point. That is, um, that's super helpful. And I think anything that we can do to make things easier for parents at this point is, is beautiful. So um, that, that's, that's pretty cool. And Anna, I really liked how you brought up the badges and how it's kind of like a gamification of the summer reading program. Um, and I have to second their support. I've reached out to them a couple of times on things and they are super fast about about responding. Um, so all good things to keep in mind and it's free. So yeah. you don't have to pay for this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so if I can, sorry. No, yeah, I was just going to say, Anna, you okay. have a couple of questions and it looks like yes. you answered them, but I want everybody to kind of get a feel, especially Courtney, of what's going on. Um, and Livingston had asked, can a person log in without having a library card? I do believe so. Um, I don't think you need any, I don't think you technically need any connection to the library at all. 
I mean, we put the link on our library website, so you needed to be able to go there, but it doesn't it doesn't require any any like actual specific library um, connection. There we go. So you don't need a library barcode number to create an account. You just nope. need an email address and a name. Yep. Okay. Basically, yeah. Um, Liz would like you to expand a little bit on why you believe uh, the adult program was saccharin because they have, yes. a, they have a lot of adult participation in Phoenicia. So I personally felt that, so the last 2019 was all about space, which was awesome because I love space. But um, I felt like the badge like progression and the way they looked as well as any of the missions. So you get missions as you go through, which were super cool for the kids. Cause it's like, we're gonna talk about the, you know, the series of planets. We're gonna talk about what gravity is. We're gonna talk about that kind of thing. And those are really cool, but they didn't have any for adults really. Um, and I think that A lot of the images that they used for last year were just, they were cute. It was cute. I think a better word instead of saccharin would be cutesy. So that might be totally fine for your community if people dig that. But I think for specifically for my community, it was just not the right, it wasn't the right aesthetic. If if I can speak like my age group, it wasn't the right aesthetic. Uh, but I do think that um, if you do have a lot of adult participation, I don't think it would be a super problem. So that would be. Okay, we, we have another one. Um, can you customize images on Read Squared? Yes. You can, sorry about that. Um, you can customize images, but they also provide images for you. Um, so you can, they already have the Imagine Your Story images plugged in and you can just use those. So it's, it's either or. I just used the images that they had because um, it was super simple and they already made it fit because changing the, dimension of an image is wacky. So Maureen um, says that you can set up challenges in the program and her teens really like that. And that she also was able to change the badge images for summer reading. So you absolutely can do that as well. Um, Alex has a question. Would, would there be a benefit to combining summer reading programs, like small groups of libraries, say three libraries in the same area during one summer reading program versus Four. Okay, I think this is probably maybe the next component, right, Courtney? Not specific necessarily to um, online, but maybe when we move on to collaboration, is that correct? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so hang tight, Alex, and we will answer your question shortly. All right, were there any other questions for Anna on RootsGrid? It doesn't look like anything's popping up. All right, so <laughs> on to prizes. <laughs> um, so I know um, when I used to go into the library for the summer reading program, there would always be like a prize cabinet and me and my siblings would go and look at the cabinet and we would decide it would take at least 20 minutes for us to all figure out what we wanted. And invariably we all got the slap bracelets or like the paper fan and it was a big deal. Um, but I think that this year we might have to think about prizes a little bit differently um, because we don't really want to hand out things that could spread germs. Um, so it might be time to start thinking about things like electronic gift cards. Um, those could be really cool for uh, for kids. So like if you have a prize that's like a $5 gift card to a local ice cream shop and you can deliver that through email, that's no contact right there, no spread of germs, very simple, everybody's happy. Um, 
I've also seen it suggested where people do scheduled pickups. So uh, if they get a prize, they have a scheduled time to come into the library and pick it up, and that way you don't have uh, crowds of people there all at once. You can kind of manage it a little bit better. I've also seen mail suggested, nothing like good old snail mail. Um, it depends. This one it could get a little bit expensive depending on uh, how many people you have in your summer reading program, um, but definitely an option. And then probably my favorite idea uh, is to donate to a charity in your community. So what you would do is you would set a community goal for everyone to read towards. And if you're like, all right, if our, our community reads like 200 books, we'll donate a dollar for every book read or or something like that. Um, you could have a goal where like if people read 200 books, like $500 gets donated or something like that. Um, but it's important to remember that if you do this, the funds can't come from your budget. They have to come from your friends group or from a partnering business or sponsor. Um, so you could do like a penny for every minute read, a dollar for every book read, uh, something like that. And the plus side to this is one, it helps a charity in your community, which in turn helps people in your community. Um, and two, it makes you look really, really good, <laughs> which can't hurt. You know, if, if there's good, we might as well have a win-win situation here where you help people and you look good doing it. Um, so if you choose to donate to a charity in your community, this could create a lot of interest in your program, creates uh, interest from local media outlets, gets you newspaper coverage, couldn't hurt, and possibly gain additional sponsors and funding, which never hurts. Um, so that's kind of the one that I'm pushing because I love that idea. Um, not only do you get to, to help people in your community that need it, um, you're encouraging kids to read while doing it. So I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good pretty good outcome. So um, I yeah, so basically, I would steer away from, from the actual physical prizes this year um, and start thinking a little bit more outside the box and, and uh, donate to a charity. <laughs> um, so I wanted to also think a little bit about accessibility. And there are many, many people in our communities, no matter what community you live in, that either don't have internet access or a computer at home and can't come to the library by themselves. And the primary group that usually can't come to the library by themselves is kids, right? Because unless kids live within walking distance of the library, they're not going to be able to get there unless their parent drives them. And if their parent is working all summer, they're not getting to the library. Um, so I wanted to think a little bit more about how to reach people who may not have internet access, can't really access the library's website or Facebook page or virtual reading logs, and can't come to the library by themselves. So Nina is going to talk a little bit about an awesome partnership that she set up uh, at the Pauling Library. And Nina, you should be unmuted, hopefully. Yes, I am. OK. So um, my library partnered with our local resource center, which uh, is a food bank in our community, and also with our local school district to distribute book bags to uh, people in our community who are the most traditionally at risk of falling behind due to the abrupt end of our ability to provide services, like being able to check out books, being able to have programming. Um, so what we did was create these book bags using some of the materials that you can see in the photo that Courtney has posted. Um, they each had three different books. We tried to differentiate the topics, um, whether it was nonfiction or fiction, the reading level, so that the kids that they were geared towards would hopefully be able to be interested and able to read at least one of them. Um, so they had books, they had a craft or two that uh, contained all the pieces and uh, elements that they would need to be able to complete the craft. And we also uh, put in literacy information that was in both Spanish and English that was relevant to their age group. And we created these for pre-K, uh, K through two, grades three through five, middle school and high school, and distributed them through the food bank and through our uh, school district's food lunch service program that was free for the community. Um, so we decided to do this because of accessibility, 100%, we have a community that is somewhat rural and has a decent 
number of folks who are offline and it was very important to our trustees and staff that we find a way to reach them. So we really focused on that, especially since reading a, like performance tends to really suffer during like moments of stress and instances where parents can't focus on things like this. And we thought it would be a nice way to, you know, provide access to materials, but also provide a reminder to families that this is very important and uh, that they can still do it from home, even if they're just doing a little bit every day. So um, we worked really hard over the last five years, probably, to cultivate relationships with different institutions in our community like the Resource Center and our schools. So this might have been a little bit easier for us to pull off quickly than it would be for other libraries that don't already have those institutional ties. Um, but I went to the schools asking them for information on what they were already doing for our community and what they might already want our community to know because I was compiling a list and like a website just of resources that were already available. So they were really interested in getting back to me to get what they were doing featured on our website so that other people could access it. And it was a really easy way for me to just get in and get a conversation started uh, where then I could add this project in. And instead of you know putting the onus on them to participate, I really knew that they were going to be very stressed out already because they are essential services, whereas we are not. So I put all the onus and all the work on our staff and our trustees where I said, we already have these available. Would you want them? Instead of saying, oh, is this something you would you know, want us to do for you? We could do it in a timeline. Um, and that seemed to be really easy for them because instead of having to think about the details when they're already so stressed out, they could just say yes. And then after they had agreed to take, you know, 30 bags, we said, okay, great, how many more do you want? And they came back to us and said, well, how about 170 more? So we went from making 30 bags for the schools to providing the schools with 200 bags, which they distributed over uh, three weeks and about 30 bags for the Resource Center Food Bank that they then turned into 90 bags and have continued to distribute. So it's been quite a wild ride, <laughs> um, but I'm really excited about this program continuing and us being able to provide uh, these services to those in our community who otherwise probably wouldn't be able to reach our library. Thanks, Nina. I was just so impressed when I saw this program. Um, it's doing exactly what it needs to do right now and reaching out to people who can't come to the library and who are probably the ones who are most in need in your community. Um, so it's it's a fantastic program and that's, um, I think you made a, a great partnership um, with the schools and the resource center. Um, does anybody have any questions for Nina on this? Um. Ooh, they're going so fast, I can't read them. Okay. Oh, so, boy. <laughs> um, this one was, is asking, Nina, um, how much did each bag cost, the book, the bag, et cetera? So we are very lucky that we collect books all year round uh, with our, our, basically our friends program does. Um, so when I came to my trustees with this project, I was actually presenting it as an idea that we could do for summer, where then I would buy a bunch of books. Um, and they came back to me and said, well, we already have all these books and we're not going to get to have our book sale this year because we traditionally have it in summer. So why don't you just use those? So that really lowered our cost per book and per bag because we used all donated books that were in very good shape that we would have otherwise been selling. Um, so our cost per bag was $2, uh, which is really great. It was very affordable uh, for the 300 bags that we ended up making we spent just under $500 total. Okay, and I think these are all of the same piece. So if you've answered this already, um, that did you buy new books and it sounds like you took them from the Friends book sale or the books Friends sale, the Friends donated the books, correct? Yeah, we took them from our, our library book sale. Okay. 
and the money that you spent that you did have to spend out as a library what part of the budget did that come from that's still a little bit in question for now it's coming from our children's programs and teen programs budgets which are two separate budget lines so the books uh, or not, excuse me, not the books, the materials that we put into the bags for teens and for tweens uh, came out of the teen line and everything for kids uh, came out of the children's line. However, we're currently working with our trustees to see if we can get this to come out of um, a more general emergency budget because it was something that uh, is not what we traditionally would use our budgets for. But it was affordable for us to do with our kids budgets for us so did you purchase any new books at all and if so where where, where did it come from we didn't purchase any books at all yeah but if i had i probably would have partnered with the scholastic program okay um and it, it these are these kits are for um children to keep correct they don't return them at all yeah everything is for them to keep and we also put in a bunch of protocol to make sure that uh, as much as possible, we were making it safe for people to keep them and not have to worry about where they'd come from and um, what was potentially on them in terms of germs. So after putting them together, we waited several uh, days before passing them out in hopes that anything that might have been on donated books would have died. Great, and um, we do have a question. They, they were created for specific age groups. I believe you said that you created them by grade. Is that correct? Yes, sort of generalized groups. So uh, one was pre-K, which was board books and uh, picture books. Then we did uh, grades K through two for some bags and grades three through five for others. That was the majority of the bags were those three groups. But we also did a small amount of bags for middle schoolers and high schoolers. Great. I think we I think we covered everything that popped up. We'll give everybody one more minute if they have another question. All right, I don't see anybody typing and nothing's coming up. And again, you know, we can always ask Nina questions after the fact. So um, I think we're good to go. Thank you so much, Nina. Yeah, thank you. This thank you so much for sharing. This is just a fantastic program. <laughs> um, so, when you think about creating partnerships, um, think like Nina did. Reach out to your schools. Reach out to your food pantries. Um, local businesses can also be great partners. Uh, local government. Um, but basically, you should look for people who are already reaching communities who are not online and that you can't access right now. Um, and to kind of answer the question that earlier, if you want to collaborate with another library on this, like go for it. <laughs> if you want to pull your resources together and the, both directors agree, I'd say you can probably make more of an impact together uh, than separately. So I would definitely recommend um, creating partnerships within our own system. So Courtney, I just want to catch you up to date. So in the um, early on when we were talking about opening summer reading early, there was a good conversation about overwhelming and overburdening um, communities. Okay. About, um, how parents are already feeling overwhelmed and they're not quite, you know, they they couldn't do, you know, a book talk right a book group right now because their kids were, you know, working on schoolwork and things. So I think the the essence of the conversation was really just sort of knowing what's going on in your community, knowing what's going on in your school district, and maybe reaching out to them to determine, you know, if there is going to be summer school, um, if there is it going to be summer school, if they, there is going to be summer school, how can the library help in that yes. respect and what would support them? Yeah. Um, and I will agree that I think people are so done with being online. I don't know if you saw our Facebook post on the Mid Hudson Library System Facebook page, but it was about being a zombie instead of a zombie where you're just tired of being online all the time. And um, I think that's definitely true. Um, so, but if we can get get kids reading, I mean, that's, that's not online. I, I do understand though that parents are very, very tired. Um, I can't even imagine at this point for anybody who has kids how tired they are. Um, but that is definitely something to keep in mind. And like I said in the beginning, there is no one size solution for your, for all communities. You have to go what is best for your community and what people are um, 
and ready for or not ready for where you live. So we do have some people who partner with their town rec centers. Amy says that all the town rec programs were canceled for the summer, um, but Livingston has a partner with their town rec department. So we're curious to see how that goes. Yeah, normally um, the, the main place that I would recommend for people to look for creating partnerships during the summer is summer camps, but I don't know if summer camps are going to be a thing this year. So uh, just just one more piece of the puzzle to keep an eye on and see where it fits in. Um, so I'm going to open it up for general questions slash sharing of thoughts now. If you have some a question in the chat you want to ask, now's the time, if you haven't already. <laughs> um, so Kristen is uh, worried about the potential for negative backlash from people who feel that we need to reopen. Is anyone else worried about this? I think everyone else is probably worried about that. Yeah, I think that's, that's a concern, but um, I also think that ultimately we're keeping people safe. So, be like, sorry, I don't want you to die. <laughs> uh, it, it is a very real concern though. And it's kind of scary to see like with the protests in Albany and everything, how people, um, people just really want things to be open. People are tired of this and that's understandable that, but at the same time, uh, we need to make sure we keep people safe. So I, my response to that would be, um, the library will open when it's safe to do so. And we will do so in a way that keeps people as safe as possible. Uh, nobody really knows what reopening is going to look like yet. I know there's lots of discussion. I've been on tons of phone calls where everybody's asking the same questions about PPE and uh, plexiglass screens to protect staff. And do we let patrons in the library for a while? I don't, nobody knows what's going to happen yet. Um, but I do know that when we reopen, we want to keep it as safe as possible for people because Honestly, I don't want somebody walking into a library and getting this and dying. Um, these are people's lives that we have to think about. So I think the best way to deal with uh, backlash is to, to kill them with kindness and just keep giving them the facts. Be like, I'm sorry, I understand you're frustrated. This is all the information we have. Um, and, on, and I think, in most cases, there are going to be more people that support your decision and understand why you're doing the things that you do, then we'll have a problem with it. So that's something to keep in mind. So it looks like everyone is nodding their heads yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that yes, we, we don't know what's going to happen. It would be nice if there was collaboration in creating a reopen um, uh, priority may be done by region and they have set that up. I don't, um, for any of you that have been listening to the governor and catching up with Mid-Hudson that we are actually, Mid-Hudson Library System is actually split, split between two of those regions in the reopening, um, what is it called, the network. So we have to sort of look at that and follow their lead. So hopefully we'll have a little more guidance based on that. Um, Nina is saying that a lot of town rec departments are joining a collaborative for online camps so um she's put that that url in the chat and we'll make sure you get that after the fact if you didn't have time to grab that um going back to the beginning i think that we had a couple of libraries say that would it be it would be really interesting for them to collaborate as libraries and Courtney you had mentioned that it would be great obviously but no better collaboration than to collaborate with your peers within the system um, so we've had at least two libraries I believe both of them are from Ulster who were interested in looking at libraries combining summer reading programs so that would be interesting to see and I know yeah. that we have a couple libraries more than a couple libraries who have connections with their schools who are reaching out to see how they can be helpful at this time yeah, and I'd say for, for any libraries that don't have their relationship with the schools, now's the best time to start, <laughs> no time like the present. Um, so if you haven't already reached out with your school, now would probably be a good time to do so. All 
All right, I'm not seeing anything else new pop up. All right, so I think we're almost at time. Um, so if anybody else has any any questions or thoughts that they want to share, um, oh, I do want to say we will be having another webinar um, in I believe two weeks. Uh, May 13th, I want to say, and it will be about the summer reading program again, but this time I want to make it more of a forum where um, you can share your ideas and plans and things that you're working on. So I'll have a link to a Google form that I'm going to send out um, where if you want to share your ideas and talk specifically at that meeting, you can fill out that form and let me know. Um, so that way I can like make a slot for you. Um, but I really want that to be more of a collaborative discussion thing where hopefully we can meet people <laughs> and uh, you can chat a little bit more and it's less of me talking. Um, so that will be coming up in about two weeks and I'll send out all the information for that. So, because this is something that's not going to go away anytime soon, obviously. And I think the more we talk about it, the better prepared we'll be for it. Okay, I don't see any new questions popping up. All right, I'm gonna say class is missed. <laughs> thank you all for coming and um, thank you to Anna and Nina for sharing uh, your experiences with some of the things that we've talked about today. I really appreciate it.